I think we're away. Good evening, everyone. We might just uh, wait a minute while everyone joins um, and we'll get things underway on our fourth um, presentations of our 2019 scholars. Alrighty, we'll, we'll make a start. Uh, good evening. For those who don't know me, I'm Rob Bradley, uh, 2009 Nuffield Scholar and Chairman of Nuffield Australia. Uh, this is our fourth evening and presentations of the 2019 Scholars. Um, as we're all aware that uh, this is the culmination of uh, Scholars scholarship and their program and their Nuffield experience. Um, unfortunately, um, we've had to resume uh, lean towards Zoom to do our presentations, which is not, not what's normally planned. And we normally would, have, the scholars would have been presenting uh, at last year's conference, but we're all aware of what, what occurred to last year. Um, so thank you. I mean, Nuffield of course doesn't occur without the, the gracious support of all our sponsors and, and supporters who, who make Nuffield occur. So um, we'd certainly like to begin with by thanking those and, um, and the support that we get from both the alumni, uh, the community, our CEO, um, and all those that make Nuffield work. So tonight's a celebration of, of scholars experience and um, a learning and a giving back to for what their scholarship has provided them. So we're gonna to start tonight with uh, Anthony Close, a Victorian scholar. Uh, Anthony's got the enviable ta task of making Merinos great again. So um, Anthony's a mixed livestock producer from Colour in Victoria, and um, I'll now get Anthony to share his screen and we'll get underway. Thanks, Rob. Uh, let's give this a go. Let's move this over there. Hello. Um, howdy everyone. My name is Anthony Close and thank you for giving me the chance to present my Nuffield Scholarship and uh, hopefully I can test a few ways of thinking today. My beautifully worded Nuffield topic is to investigate ways that Merinos can once again become a prominent feature of the Australian farming landscape. But my original thought and the slogan that I ran with before I went for my Nuffield was make Merinos great again. And Big Donald, he gave it a thumbs up. He liked the slogan. I also have to thank every sheep producer that produces wool for the chance to be able to have this experience at the sure levies that have invested in me through the Nuffield experience. So thank you. I'd also like to extend a thanks to everyone at AWI who's been extremely accommodating and helpful throughout the whole process right from the start and all across the globe. So thank you. A bit about myself before we kick off. I'm from Western Victoria, where I farm with my parents and two brothers in our family farming business called Karawera, where we run a mixed sheep and cattle operation, as well as seed stock of both. So a huge thank you to my family, my mentors locally, and especially my fiance Bridget for the year I had in 2019. So what's the issue? We've seen a significant drop in the sheep flock from around 150 million in 1992, back to less than 70 currently. On the same slide, you can see the wool bales follow the same pattern. On the right slide, you can see cropping has been the biggest threat to sheep farming. For a long period, sheep have lost the fight for acres to cropping, where we've seen a mass movement from sheep production into crop production. The next issue is also a significant decline in the workforce. A lot of older sheep farmers and not a lot of young ones coming into the industry and 85% of sheep labour is actually family labour. The next point is around benchmarking and profitability. My granddad, he used to say, there's always money in sheep, sometimes money in cattle, and there's never money in racehorses, and he was pretty right. The hard part for me to get my head around was people flocking out of the industry when our own personal benchmarking 
as well as other, many others, benchmark, different benchmarking across Australia, shows us that merinos and sheep have been a very profitable, low-risk enterprise. So people don't just follow the money is what I'm trying to say. And to me, it just didn't make sense, the mass exodus. So this all led to me choosing my topic. The last reason was because of it's part of our family business. Merino is a part of our DNA and we're passionate about them. So to see people leaving the industry at a rapid rate of knots just didn't sit, sit right with me. So how do you tackle the issue in front of us? I thought through my travels and I've worked it down to the three most important things that would make the most influence on the sheep and merino industry. These were the sheep industry structure, wool marketing, new and new technology to make sheep farming better. First up, we have the sheep industry structure and do we currently have it right? I've always been a person that looks at things and tried to imagine how we would set it up if we hadn't done it yet or hadn't done it before. What's the best possible way to attack this? When I was overseas for the four and a half months, I went through 11 countries and visited, uh, and that I visited throughout my Nuffield. And we saw a lot of different industries, their structures, and I went to a lot of different farms where I was able to build an idea of what works and what doesn't. Whether it was the National Chicken Council in America, the Kiwi Fruit Growers in New Zealand, the Dutch Dairy Farmers or Brazilian Cotton Growers, there was many different ways to go about it, I'll assure you. It made me appreciate the levy funded research and development bodies we have here in Australia or R&Ds um, that we have and how vital they are. It also showed me how important it is to have united farms behind them and how great things can happen on farm and how quickly it can happen if we get a clear focus and all in the right direction. The current challenges we have as, a, as sheep producers are the disunity. No one, in, no one is the same. You have wool versus sheep meat. We have different breeds, different locations, and it all divides us and keeps us apart. We have separate R&D bodies for the one animal, and they don't work well enough together as they don't have aligned core values, which I'll touch on more in the next slide. The sheep industry structure, the sheep industry has been hamstrung for a long time by our levy bodies not working together, money wasted on the duplication of research policy and government lobbying. And thirdly, why are we in the same research and development group as beef producers, especially northern ones? As sheep producers, we need to get out of beef shadow. MLA is dominated by big cattle people, and we're a small industry compared to cattle, with wool being around three and a half billion and sheep meat around six and a half billion, compared to beef, which is nearly 20 billion. We have massively different animals in sheep and cattle, and a conflict of interest when it comes to the trade table. The black line on the graph there shows a declining flock with the red and blue columns showing where the gross value produced comes from in the sheep industry. And obviously back in the early nineties, we had a hugely wool dominated flock through to now where we are very close to 50, 50 split between sheep meat and wool. So if we look here at which, at the ways that sheep producers make their profit with the current system, we have a separate in, a industry body for each of the wool and sheep meat. Both AWI and MLA have invested interest to push their own products it'll help, as it'll help increase their levies. The problem being is that wool and sheep meat production have an antagonistic relationship. The more we produce of one, generally the less we produce of another. So who's, but who's worried about the top the total value produced, which is what all sheep uh, producers are about. They don't care if it's wool, they don't care if it's sheep meat. They just care that the profit's coming in. So my recommendations are to split the sheep meat off MLA and bring the sheep meat and wool industry under the one R&D roof. So we create a sheep industry body that is solely focused on sheep producers and sheep and their long-term sustainability and profitability. The second area of study I chose was array as an industry, we market our wool. Wool is the fundamental point of difference we have against other breeds. So it's something as merino producers, we need to get right if we're gonna make the merino great again. When I traveled, I was lucky enough to get unbelievable access to the wool industry supply chain and mainly thanks to AWI. I attended the Nanjing Wool Conference in Shandong province, China as an AWI guest where I got to sit in on industry trade talks between China and Australia. I visited and got personalized access to the five biggest wool processing facilities in China, 
uh, three in the UK and two in Italy, where we got access to the owners or top end staff to ask, que ask questions with no filters. I attended the Intertextile, which is a major textile and fa fabric convention in China, and got to pick the brains of the AWI marketing staff across the globe, as well as brokering companies in New Zealand. I got to talk to brands all across the world and talk to farmers in Australia and New Zealand to get their opinion on the situation. So a fair chunk of my personal travel was based on this area. The current situation is wool goes to the auction system, then we lose contact. We get bugger all feedback except for price, and even then it's hard to determine what drove that price. As we know, supply chains dictate on-farm behaviour and transactions-based supply chains like we are in with wool, where you never know the person, uh, where you're only connected to the person directly next to you in the supply chain, it breeds short-term thinking. Long-term contracts are the key for, this, for rebuilding the Australian wool industry. I travelled to New Zealand and saw what the New Zealand, what the brokering company New Zealand Merino were doing. New Zealand Merino have 70% of the Merino wool in New Zealand and 70% of that is contracted for three, five or 10 years. I could see that long-term contracts brought everyone into the mindset of how we can build the supply chain together, build the pie. Everyone in the supply chain can budget and invest in their business as they know exactly what the forecast price will be taking the risk out of the supply chain for everyone. It's a different scale in Australia, I know, and uh, compared to New Zealand, but it's something we really need to learn from. All their contracts were backed by QA program ZQ. The contracts are linking producers to brands, which allow information to freely flow up and down the supply chain, giving them the knowledge to adapt and change before issues even arise. We don't buy and sell wool anymore. We sell the story behind it. And that's a quote from Francesco at Rader, and he believes that this type of supply chain is what we need for the future to allow him to sell the story behind the wool. Recommendations. For brokers to do more marketing and change the supply chain to do more long-term contracts between producers and brands. Wool growers need to sign up to, a, to QA programs to assure customers of their environmental, social, and animal welfare statuses. The third area of research that I looked at was to help find some new technology that could help make our merinos great again. And those two pieces of technology were the foot rot breeding value and virtual fencing. Where I live in Western Victoria, we have lost a lot of acres to the north from cropping and to the south from beef and composite sheep. And I believe these two new, two new techno technologies will help regain some lost ground. First new piece of technology is the foot rot breeding value, which I saw firsthand at old Nuffield scholar Ben Todd Hunter's farm at Clairdale Station in New Zealand. In New Zealand, foot rot isn't a declarable disease. There isn't a stigma around it and no one is shut out of markets. They just get on with dealing with the problem. We need to change the stigma in Australia around foot rot so people deal with the problem rather than suppressing and ignoring it. Foot rot the trait is made up of 14 different chromosomes it's 18% heritable, and there is plenty of genetic variation to be able to exploit through breeding, which they are doing in New Zealand. They're pushing sheep back into areas of New Zealand that they never thought possible, thanks to this breeding value. The second new piece of technology is virtual fencing, which could be the single, single biggest quantum leap in livestock production. The photo on the top left, I took from one of the first talks at our CSC in Iowa in 2019 and I quickly related it back to the sheep industry. Virtual fencing technology would jump the industry from barely being mechanical with minimal parts of the industry being precision agriculture to an industry that is near autonomous. Precision ag would be at every sheep producer's fingertip through their mobile device and certain parts of their sheep management would become autonomous. And the tech's closer than you think. I visited no fence in Norway which have virtual fencing commercially available for sheep, goats and beef while other companies like Agerson in Australia and Halter in New Zealand will be releasing products for cattle very soon. The no fence uh, is still very expensive while Agerson is supposed to be in the black on a cost benefit analysis for cattle, but not quite there yet for sheep due to the number of colours needed. Benefits of virtual fencing are huge. It will boost on-farm production and save labour. And from a cropping point of view, virtual fencing is the only way I can see large integration of livestock 
back into the cropping system that have removed all their fences, but it has great connectivity infrastructure. You also talk about the pressures globally on, lifos on glyphosate and livestock could play an active role to help with the summer weed control. Livestock are also the key to regenerative agriculture and building soil carbon. So to get livestock back in there could be huge for the cropping soils. With virtual fencing, there is a building case for livestock to go back into the cropping system. It also has the potential for hazard reduction grazing. Australia was on fire in the 1920 summer, where in Norway, they used goats to reduce vegetation in their mountainous areas. So my final recommendations are for foot rot. We need to change the legislation so that foot rot is not a declarable disease and to invest in further linkage trials in Australia to help build the foot rot breeding value into a trait that commercial sheep producers can readily use and understand in their breeding objective. And continue to invest in virtual fencing technology to make it a commercially viable piece of technology for sheep producers. Thank you. Oh, no. How do we unshare that screen now? Thanks, Anthony. Uh, terrific presentation. Um, it's just amazing how much the world has changed in the time in which you travelled to think that you're in China sitting talking about uh, trade negotiations and all that's happened in, in the interim on that front. And it's also great to know that you can still learn things from old Nuffield scholars. So that's a pleasing thing for me to hear. Um, we'll keep moving on. Just if you've got questions and answers, can you please put them down in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll come to them at the end of the, of the five presentations. Um, also remember that the scholars are having to squeeze an 18 month program into 10 minutes tonight. Um, as Winston Churchill said, when he gave a long speech, he didn't have time to write a short one. So uh, it's a difficult process and it's really hard cramming such a wonderful experience into a short space of time. So let's move on to Christina. I won't take up any more time. So Christina uh, Kelman uh, is a organic horticultural producer from Wallachia in the West of Sydney. Um, and we'll now get Christina to share her screen and we're away. Are you right to go there, Christina? You might be on mute. Uh, we can't hear you, Christina. Okay, all good now. All good now. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, um, thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to our presentations. Um, when I did my Nuffield scholarship, um, I wanted to look at the topic of how we can make organics accessible to all. Um, I joined my parents' farm uh, about four years ago and one of the things that I noticed very quickly is that uh, through selling organic vegetables, we were mostly selling them um, in areas like Bondi, um, Neutral Bay, North Sydney, and kind of the, the common areas in Sydney where uh, the income levels are uh, of a higher uh, level. And um, I remember one of these, like one day, this older lady came to me and she uh, wanted to buy some lettuce and uh, she was haggling with me. So she wanted to buy it for a dollar when we usually sell it for $2 or two fifty. And to be honest, I was quite annoyed. You know, I, I knew the kind of effort that went into producing that lettuce. And I, I kind of get the annoyance that you usually feel when someone tries to rip you off. Um, but it sort of got me thinking about the accessibility of organic produce um, and how we can actually make that more accessible. And instead of going down a traditionally like fluffy route to answer that question, I really thought of it um, from a basic economics principle, which is uh, supply and demand and how we can actually solve this problem um, by simply looking at this graph. Because at the moment, the price of organic produce is making it less accessible to people um, is simply a fact of uh, the su organic supply not being able to meet the increasing demand. And over the last 10 years, uh, the organic horticultural industry has grown uh, in by over 40%. And so how can we look at um, that graph um, and look at how can we actually increase supply in order to meet that demand. So I wanted to look at the um, Nuffield project in terms of in the eyes of a farmer. So really in the eyes of my mum, 
And if my mom was approaching this question, she would think of it in two ways. The first way for her is how can she reduce the cost? So how can she reduce the cost of fertilizer? How can she reduce the amount of hand labor that is required um, for hand weeding and all the other complications that come with organic farming? But on the other side, how is she actually able to increase her yield? So instead of producing uh, one ton of tomatoes, how can she go to producing three? And how can she go to matching conventional yields? Um, and in a very simple form, it's essentially about how can she reduce those inputs and increase those outputs? And so my Nuffield adventure was really exciting. Um, and something that I learned very early on um, is that I find modern horticulture to be quite reactive. Um, and something where I see the difference between organic and conventional agriculture is that the modern conventional uh, horticultural industry is very reactive. And uh, you, can draw, you can draw some similarities between human health um, and agricultural health. So for example, it's very common now when you get sick, you go to the doctor to get antibiotics. And in the same sense, you know, when you have a plant disease or an insect problem, you spray with pesticides or fungicides. And something that I learned through my travels and visiting all these small organic farms is just how producers are thinking more proactively. So in the sense of not just thinking, how can I go to the doctor and get antibiotics? How do we start thinking about looking after my health proactively with changing my diet, my exercise, reducing alcohol or reducing stress? In the same sense, I saw that these farmers were focused on their health proactively with looking at soil health, Mineral, mineral nutrition, compost, microbiology, and you name it. And what I found is that organic farmers were really trying to expand their toolbox. They have been taken away, this, these really crucial tools such as uh, synthetic chemicals, glyphosate, etc. But instead they were expanding the toolbox of what they could use as farmers with uh, focusing in on forgotten techniques like mineral nutrition, compost, cover cropping, microbiology, weed control, IPM and disease control. Um, it's not enough time in 10 minutes to explore all the things uh, that I saw on my trip because in my individual trip alone, I went to over 65 farms and there's so many things that I took away from each farm, but I'm just gonna focus on the specific techniques that within the year coming back from my Nuffield travels, we were able to implement at the farm and then showed success in those areas. And I'm gonna show you how we implemented them. So the first one was uh, when I went to the Netherlands, I went to a commercial greenhouse operation, uh, which was focused on producing tomatoes and capsicums. This was really interesting because actually tomatoes and capsicums come from a very similar family. And so the amount of soil uh, disease buildup was incredible because you know year after year, they're just growing the same crops and they're building up all this uh, weed disease uh, pressure inside the greenhouse. And um, they had this issue where, you know, they have really expensive land, so they couldn't move all the time. So they had to use the soil that they had. So they used everything. They used, um, they cooked the soil, they steamed the soil, they took the soil out and replaced the soil. You know, they tried everything to see how can we actually reduce those kind of diseases. Um, and eventually they took a really old technique that comes from Japan. Um, and it was then studied at Wagenham University and renamed as ASD or anaerobic soil disinfestation, which is exactly how it sounds um, in the sense that they were able to turn the soil anaerobic to essentially cook the soil and change the balance um, of nematodes and pathogens in the soil in order to balance it out. And so we were able to test this um, at Reader's Farm and we had a hypothesis that uh, we had a really big issue in our greenhouses uh, with root knot nematodes decreasing our uh, cucumber yield. And so we had a hypothesis that ASD would reduce the uh, populations of root knot nematodes in the soil. Um, so we were able to mark the areas where we uh, carried out this process. Um, and yeah, and it was fantastic the kind of results that we got. We had a 20% higher yield in the greenhouses that we used it in and no noticeable root knot nematode in the marked areas. Um, so it was definitely a technique that we'll be bringing into the future and something that I think is gaining a lot of popularity in the organic farm, but also in the commercial farm industry. The second thing that I saw was in a farm in Germany, uh, it's called Live to Give. And this was the first exa commercial example of a farm that I saw that used no-till for their entire production. 
Um, so I've seen a lot of no-till practices, but mostly mum and dad uh, pop farms. Uh, but this was a commercial operation using no-till, producing vegetables um, at high yields. Um, so I was extremely interested and I wanted to see what were the practices that went along with these no-till practices. Um, so he introduced me and basically showed me his fertilizer shed in which most of his fertilizers were homemade. So everything from uh, fungicides, fertilizers, insecticides, um, weed control, everything was homemade. Um, and I was really curious in terms of uh, what these biofertilizers were, what the recipes were, um, how much it cost to produce and how effective they were. So when I came home, we were able to produce our own range of biofertilizers, um, which actually reduced our cost roughly in about $8,000 in the comparative spending of fertilizer, fungicide and insecticide spending. Um, and our hypothesis was that we would increase the amount of organic matter in the soil and increase yield. Um, but we haven't got a result on that one. And so if you like, you can check in with me in a year and I can let you know how it goes. And the third one was that I was able to go to Agritechnica, which was a uh, massive tractor conference in Germany. Um, basically every single type of farming machinery, equipment, tractors, it was in there. Um, it was about 20 hectares of equipment um, and conference set up. Um, so it was definitely a really interesting experience and I was able to see over 20 different types of weed control equipment um, and all the technologies that existed out there from your simple tine weeders to robotics. Um, and so this is really different to the last one. The last one was about reducing spending, but actually when I came back from my Nuffield experience, I asked dad to spend a bit more on some equipment. Um, and so our hypothesis was that we were, we wanted to figure out some mechanical ways in order to reduce our weed pressure. Um, considering that we don't use glyphosate, we needed a way to be able to sustainably use the same land and continue to use that land without having so much weed pressure. Um, and so we trialed a specific piece of equipment called Trefla and we used it with a technique used in the US called pre-irrigation where you basically continually flush out the weeds, um, get rid of it using springtime weeders um, and then reduce your weed population within the first four weeks by about 90%. Um, and we had incredible success with this, um, so much so that we were able to uh, like reposition two of our staff to uh, into harvest that would normally just be focused on weed control. So I talked a lot about reducing inputs um, and obviously these are the ones that we implemented at our farm, but there's definitely uh, a lot more techniques um, that I learned on the way. Um, However, on the other side, I also wanted to look at increasing output. So how do you increase yield? And what I did when I went overseas is that I was actually able to meet a lot of farmers and a lot of direct to consumer farmers. Um, so I was actually really surprised because um, these are, I was actually really surprised at how commercial these direct to consumer farmer uh, models were. So in my head, uh, we have these like small organic farmers that are just making a living um, and just producing, you know, some small boxes for their small community. But I was able to go to farms that are producing, you know, farm to table subscription boxes of up to 60,000 a week. So I'm talking like direct to consumer farmers that have really commercialized their operations. And I was actually incredibly um, humbled by the opportunity to be able to meet all these people. But it also got me thinking about how the direct to consumer model is actually something um, not to be brushed over and is definitely on the rise and is definitely has real potential um, for a lot of farmers to produce an income. Um, so things like farmers markets, packaging, niche products, direct relationships with retailers. So rather than uh, just having a relationship with Walmart, the head office, it would be the separate stores um, and then communicating with each manager of each store. CSA, um, so what I was talking about with subscription boxes um, and farms having their own e-commerce platforms. So when I came back from um, the Nuffield experience, we were able to launch our own uh, home delivery subscription service within Sydney and Canberra, and we had incredible success. It was kind of well-timed because it was also in the heat of COVID. Um, but we were able to actually make it so successful that it became 18% of our total revenue. 
Um, so, and it also enabled us to maintain all farm workers and staff during COVID, uh, which was really, really uh, an incredible success for us. So I started off um, this research thinking that I would just create a, a sort of guide or a uh, toolbox for organic farmers to become better, to be able to get higher yields and reduce their costs. Um, but in my venture to, to look at organic and conventional farmers, what I realized is that in farming, we tend to put a lot of boxes around people. So we say, those are the you know, regenerative farmers and those are the beef farmers and those are the organic farmers and those are the conventional farmers. And we sort of box people um, and say, these are the rules that you need to live by in order to be an organic farmer, or these are the rules that you live by in order to be a regenerative farmer. And I always thought that my project would be more about empowering organic farmers to be better so we can make organics accessible to all. But something that I'm sort of wrapping my head around is that in order to make organics accessible for all, maybe it's not just about empowering organic farmers uh, to be better, but maybe it's more about how do we give the tools that organic farmers are using to conventional growers in order to bring conventional, bring that box more to the organic side. And then perhaps it's not necessarily about bringing certified organic produce being accessible to all people, but how do we make the produce that is accessible to all a more safe, a better product, one that's better for the environment, better for our health um, and better in terms of farming practices. Um, so looking at practices like less chemical usage, IPM, compost, effective microorganisms and mechanical weed control are not just techniques for organic farmers, but actually for both. Um, and that's how I really believe that we are able to make organics accessible to more to all. And so finally, I just want to thank Nuffield uh, for the incredible and humbling experience to be able to go to so many countries um, and just meet farmers that have just inspired me um, and have struggled, learned um, and really persevered through their experience. And big thanks to um, Horde Innovation for sponsoring my project and supporting me this whole time. And finally, I want to close with uh, thanking my parents. Um, they're the ones that inspired me to come back to the farm and they're the ones that held up the fort and they inspire me every day to be a better person. So thank you so much. Thanks, Christina. Fantastic presentation. And, um, you know, one of the really great things to see from your learnings is that you, as you traveled and, and saw and, and interacted with people, you brought them home to your own business and implemented them, um, to in many ways immediately and, and seen a terrific result from those learnings, which is what, what the Nuffield experience is all about and, and then transferring that knowledge across the industry. So well done, fantastic presentation. It was a joy to see. Uh, our next presentation, uh, please keep bringing those Q&A questions through. That would be terrific to get them at the end. Our next uh, scholar is Jake Newman, who's from Campania in uh, Southern Tasmania. Uh, Jake is a cherry producer and uh, I'll let Jake introduce himself. So far away, Jake. All right. How's that, Rob? Is that coming up? Can you hear me? No, it's not there Hello? yet. I can hear you, Jake, but uh, the presentation, I'm not, given that I'm also in Tasmania, everyone, uh, the, the, the uh, Jake's uh, audio and text are often a little bit slower than one another. So it's nothing to do with Tasmania. It's just the way it's coming through. Mm. Uh, is it on the, are we there yet or? Still not showing up. We've just got your notes on the presentation. Okay. Uh, let me try again. Bear with me. How about this time? We're away. Yep, just hit beginning from the beginning. Yeah. You've got the, the front page up? Yep, we're all good, Jake. Far away. All right. Once again, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. 
Uh, good evening. My name is Jake Newnham, and tonight I will be speaking to you about the focus of my Nuffield study, which was improving sweet cherry fruit quality, with specific points of focus being harvesting, uh, packing procedures, cold chain management, and packaging to optimise fruit quality and extend shelf life. And I'd like to thank Woolworths for their generous support. I'd also like to thank my family for basically letting me take off for half a year and taking care of everything while I was away. And my GSP family, my second family, I think about you guys every day. I couldn't imagine doing what we did with a better bunch of people. I'd also like to thank Nuffield Australia. I know there's an incredible amount of work that goes into making these scholarships a reality. I'll be forever grateful, especially considering the current situation around the globe. I'm from a family farm in the Coal River Valley of Tasmania called Lodina. We've been growing fruit now for just over 20 years. Having start as a blank piece of dirt, as you see opposite us, opposite the road there, we've built up to now maintaining 25 hectares of producing orchard. And we currently grow, pack and market about 125 tonnes of cherries and 90 tonnes of apricots, as well as contract packing about another 100 tonnes of cherries for other growers. While very much on the smaller side of the industry, it's more than enough to keep a family busy, that's for sure. The main difference between the Tasmanian cherry industry and that of the mainland is that we're much more focused on export with the, with the bulk of that export going towards Asia. Within that Asian marketplace, we represent 1% or even less of the market share. The vast majority of that remaining 99% is from Chile, where the production is continuing to rise and the cost of production is significantly less than ours. Achieving a premium price is completely dependent on fruit consistently achieving a premium quality. A quick look at the retail price of cherries in 2017-18 in China shows us either due to a superior quality or simply a consumer conception of superior quality. With Chile's production continuing to rise, market saturation is quite likely at some point and some producers could potentially be squeezed into unviability. The importance of producing high quality fruit has never been greater than right now. With that in mind, I set out to spend eight weeks in seven of what I considered the most export significant growing regions in the world. Starting from Mall and O'Higgins region in Chile, the Central Valley, California, the Dalles in Oregon, Wenatchee, Washington State, Okanagan Valley in, in BC, and Central Otago, New Zealand. Whilst I tried to have as many different conversations with as many people as I could on a wide range of topics, I tried to focus up my research on five key objectives of this study. The first thing, what is the best handling practice to get fruit from the orchard to the packing shed with as little impact on fruit quality as possible? Current, hand, current cherry handling practices around the world are generally consistent with those found in Tasmania and the mainland in general. Many farms tip cherries into plastic bins for ease of transport, although it's certainly not uncommon to see more valuable or fragile varieties kept in lugs or small buckets right up until the point of packing, as we see here in Chile on the left and Washington State on the right. With that in mind, it's generally accepted that reducing the amount of time fruit is transferred from container to container will in fact reduce the amount of harvest sustained during the harvesting process. If we compare that to what we see here on our farm, wooden bins are fairly common in Australia and it would not be surprising in the next five or 10 years if the industry completely moves towards plastics. What cold chain management practices are given the strongest focus around the world? Almost all commercial cherry producers utilise hydrocooling, which is using very cold water to cool, to cool cherries out of the field to a pulp temperature of under five degrees as soon as practical or possible. Considerable shelf life may be lost between harvest and hydrocooling. It's often been said that cherries lose more quality at 21 degrees in one hour than they do at zero degrees in one week. The single biggest contributing factor to this shelf life decline is fruit respiration rate, which itself is directly related to the storage temperature of the fruit. 
the, the, this linear relationship as shown here shows quite clearly that the cooler the fruit, the less it respires. Consequently, fruit should be cooled as quickly as possible after picking and held at as low as possible temperature after packing. Forced air cooling is common practice globally. What benefits could we see from the implementation of this procedure? Forced air cooling is a process that involves a fan between two rows of palletized cherries and a tarp placed over the void between. Suction from the fan within this void pulls cool air from the cool room over the cherries and cools them. This is common practice in Chile and the US, but still in its infancy here. The main drawback to this method is that cooling fruit with air is considerably more inefficient than cooling fruit with water. So why would we do it? It's been known for some time, in fact, 1993, this study, that pitting frequency increases exponentially, as shown here on this graph, as fruit is handled cooler and cooler. Pitting is a physical injury to fruit, which is often not seen for several days or perhaps even weeks after fruit has been dispatched often showing up right as it's reaching the final consumer. Packing fruit at a slightly warmer temperature and subsequently forced air cooling the fruit in theory will greatly reduce the incidence of pitting, which is one of the greatest drivers of fruit breakdown. What type of packaging is most commonly used with the intention of providing the greatest shelf life? A quick look at some box designs from around the world shows us that vented packaging is quite common, if not the standard. This allows the, the use of forced air cooling if required and ensures that the coolest possible pulp temperature can be achieved at dispatch. With many producers in Chile and the US aiming for about one degree fruit temperature at dispatch. In fact, many sheds such as the Milt in Washington state will not send anything out the door if the fruit temperature is greater than one degree. Compare that to what we currently use in Tasmania. This style of packaging was built around meeting specific biosecurity requirements for access into Asian export markets. Studies on this type of packaging has shown that fruit stored in cool rooms has very, shows very little, if any, further reduction in core temperature. This means that our fruit will not reach the optimal fruit temperature unless we pack it at excessively cold temperatures. This is gonna undoubtedly increase the incidence of pitting and quite simply defy the point of seeking a greater shelf life. For producers to utilise forced air cooling, it will of course require us to change our box, our box designs to include vents. One other viable alternative is inline hydrocooling, as we see here in New Zealand. During this process, fruit is still sized and sorted at a slightly warmer temperature <coughs> before being submerged or showered in very cool water. This is done immediately before box filling. The main advantage of this system would be that our current box designs would not need to be changed, as well as having the increased efficiency, efficiency of cooling with water versus cooling with air. At least two packing sheds in Tasmania that I know of have converted their lines to include inline hydrocooling within the last 12 months. And it's fantastic to see an industry-wide approach to getting fruit cooler, reducing pitting, and putting a better quality of fruit in Tasmanian cherry boxes. With most cherries purchased in Australia sold by the major supermarkets, how do current handling practices by retailers compare with their global counterparts? Handling of cherries by retailers varies drastically around the world, although those with the strongest focus on quality generally display, display fruit in refrigerated uh, cases. Far too often, both abroad and indeed here domestically, cherries were found on room temperature display tables. Since the shelf life and inherent quality of cherries is strongly linked to the storage temperature, it's unsurprising that the consumer is often left with an inferior product and an unpleasant eating experience. The cherries on the left were from Wenatchee, Washington for sale for roughly $14 a kilo versus on the right in a premium high-end supermarket in Hong Kong. These cherries would have started out their life and left the packing shed in almost identical condition. If we want to increase cherry consumption domestically, producers will need to work together with retailers and improve cold chain management and handling practices. Cherries leave packing sheds 
in a similar condition to show what's shown here. And there is no scientific reason whatsoever why they cannot make it to the consumer in the same condition. The fact that fruit quality for sale by retailers domestically has not improved possibly in the last 10 years is quite frankly a failure on the behalf of the cherry industry. Achieving a cooler fruit pulp temperature was a mission that our business had set out on long before I started my Nuffield experience. But seeing everything that I've seen overseas has further reinforced my opinion that we're on the right track. We've used this redesigned box here for the past two seasons, as far as I know, the first in Tasmania. And just this season, just completed, built our own forced air cooler based on designs that I had seen overseas. Again, to my knowledge, the first in Tasmania. Despite some inherent challenges getting started, we were able to achieve what we set out to achieve from the beginning and received some of the best feedback from our customers that we have before. Thanks for listening. Jake, thanks very much. Um, it's really great to see that that what Nuffield really is all about, and it sort of dates back to um, the the essence of what Nuffield started out being was going away and seeing and seeing technologies and bringing it back to both your own business, but also the community. And it's uh, great to see you've done that. And uh, thanks for a terrific presentation and uh, look forward to some good questions on it. So thanks, Jake. We'll move on to Natasha Shields. Uh, Natasha uh, from Baxter in Victoria with her husband owns a certified organic vegetable growing business uh, in Victoria. Uh, Natasha's topic is alternative packaging options and shelf life outcomes for fresh produce to minimise the use of plastics in retail. So I'll ask Natasha to share her screen, please. You're right. away now. Are we good to go? Good to go. Hi everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Rob. I own and run a certified organic vegetable farm with my husband, Wayne. We started on this farm with three acres back in 2009 and now have two farms with a total growing area of 150 acres. I'm just going to share now a short video with you to give you a bit of an insight into our farm before I continue. Hi, I'm Natasha Shields and together with my husband Wayne, we own and run Peninsula Fresh Organics. We started in 2009 growing chemical free heirloom varieties of vegetables. We started selling our vegetables at local farmers markets around Melbourne and in 2010 we became certified organic. The reason for my topic, alternatives to plastic packaging on fresh produce, is because we started supplying Australian supermarkets in around 2017. The supermarkets required our produce to be packaged mainly because we are certified organic. Our business grew faster than we expected and we're still looking for faster ways of getting our produce packed. One of the biggest costs to our business is packaging. And I think that if we need to spend so much money on packaging, wouldn't it be better if the product was not harmful to the environment? We're still very manual, as you can see. We are very much a family business and we all get involved when we need to. We started off with just us and now we employ 35 staff, most of who are full time. We are now farming on two different farms, Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, as well as Barham up on the Murray in New South Wales. We bought the second farm in New South Wales to spread our growing risk with regards to access to water and extending growing seasons on our various lines. We continue to sell our produce at the various farmers markets in Melbourne, attending roughly five markets every weekend. We also have our two farm shops where we sell retail to the public, as well as wholesale markets in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane.
My 2019 scholarship took me to 19 countries in just over 18 weeks. I traveled just under 213,000 kilometers. I visited many farms as well as food summits, expos and packaging specific events around the globe. I met with many companies involved in both recyclable and compostable packaging. I did cut the last part of my trip short as I was in the US when COVID-19 hit. I got the first, first available flight home just as Melbourne went into lockdown. The objective of my scholarship was to find alternatives to plastic packaging on food projects. The reason for this was initially driven by the demands on our own business by the retailers we supply. My, object, my objectives were find alternatives to plastic packaging, find options that will keep projects fresher for longer, seek economically viable alternatives, search for compostable or biodegradable options, and also to better understand the war on waste. Why did I choose this? because this is really important to us and to the environment. In the horticultural industry, packaging needs on fresh produce are constantly changing for various reasons, such as marketing, protecting produce and convenience options for the consumer. In particular, in both Australia and overseas, I found that organic produce typically requires more packaging than conventional produce. The main reason for this seems to be so that the product is easily identifiable as organic at the checkout, thus enabling the correct price for the retailer. However, there is also no denying that produce sold in plastic packaging does have a prolonged shelf life. I spoke to a local grower, Sam Taranto of Taranto Farms. He told me that his twin pack of leeks that, that are sold nationally have a shelf life of 14 to 21 days compared to single leeks which are sold without any packaging typically lasting around seven days. Similarly, carrots can last for several months in the fridge if packed in airtight packaging, compared to maybe just one week in the fridge without a covering. I learned about the circular economy during my travels. This is a system that aims to promote the continual use of resources and eliminating waste. In Australia alone, over 7.3 million tonnes of food ends up in landfill. That is equivalent to 13,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools at a value of $20 billion. This also equates to around 5% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So what options are there? For retailers, I, look, retailers, I looked at current market alternatives. Misting systems. I met with Contronics from the Netherlands. They have a system that uses minimal water to create a dry mist, and this system replicates morning mist as seen hovering over the crops in the fields. The mist evaporates around the produce, causing a rise in humidity and a drop in temperature for the produce. Testing has proven that produce remains fresher for longer without getting wet. This system works best on leafy greens and I am seeing more and more in our local supermarkets that we're adopting similar systems for some of their leafy green vegetables. Contronics mission statement is to alleviate 25% of food waste. Another cosmetic benefit of these misting systems is the wow factor while in operation. It's very impressive to see. In addition to misting systems, I explored compostable packaging options. I visited Celergy in our house, Denmark. Co-founder Debbie von Papiang told me about their relatively new product called EcoFlexi. This product has attracted a fair bit of attention in Europe and they were even finalists to receive a National Geographic grant. EcoFlexi is derived from food waste, primarily food pulp from companies such as PepsiCo. The pulp is fermented and turns into sugars. The top of the ferment is, forms a cellulose layer and is quite transparent. Debbie told me that EcoFlexi is actually also good for the home garden or compost as it totally biodegrades in as little as four weeks at a temperature of around 20 degrees Celsius. It can also be recycled with paper and cardboard products. A byproduct of the manufacturing process can also be used as a salad dressing or a probiotic if desired. The whole process is utilised without any waste or environmental damage. To be truly compostable and home compostable, it must put nutrition back into the soil. I also spoke with Nathan from Grounded Packaging, an Australian owned company. I learned that their flexible compostable packaging is made from corn, potatoes, rice and pre-polymers. Their manufacturing takes place in China, Israel, USA, Germany, and Malaysia. Grounded is certified to both commercial and domestic compostable standards. Currently, their packaging can be found on items such as uh, meat products and pouch bags for food, including apples. Nathan mentioned that supermarkets believe this packaging is irrelevant as it is ultimately the consumer 
who is disposing of the packaging incorrectly. Sales director Olivier from Tagliff Industries, who I met whilst in Madrid, told me that their products, Nativia, are primarily made from cornstarch. Currently, their products are commercially compostable only, but not home compostable due to it taking around six months to biodegrade. Their product will not um, biodegrade in landfill conditions either. Consumer perceptions. It is a popular perception that compostable bioplastics are produced from food that might otherwise be available to feed the world. Fact, many options are made from the starch derived from food waste, not from the food itself. Another perception is that GMO-based corn starches might transfer onto food packaging and onto the food it is protecting. Fact, DNA does not transfer onto the food. Impacts of COVID-19, well, that was quite a year we had last year. It is likely that some form of packaging on fresh produce is preferred by the retailers and consumers to protect the food from COVID-19 germs caused by like coughing or overhandling. I have experienced this in my own retail stores as well as at farmers markets. The pre-packaged baby cos sells out before the loose banded baby cos. Conclusion, in light of my studies and the pandemic, I believe there is no magic bullet to solve the issues at present. Issues remain ongoing due to major retailers' requirements on produce packaging. One of the major retailers we are looking to implement, one of the retailer we supply currently are looking to implement less packaging, however. Will this reduce shelf life on these products? Less packaging will definitely reduce the cost to the grower. However, will there be even more food waste due to supermarket environments? The consumer ultimately makes the final choice in what happens to their packaging on their produce. And this comes down to education, either by the retailer, local government, or on the packaging itself. My recommendations. I believe that further research is needed to better understand the requirements on fresh produce in the retail sector. Further investment by government regarding labelling standards is required. To make compostable packaging more economically viable, more producers and packing companies need to come on board. Obviously, more volume will reduce the costs. Furthermore, the major retail chains need to be on the same page regarding packaging, be it recyclable or compostable. Local government needs to play a greater role in sustainability, enforcing either recycling or composting options. Only a few of the local councils in Victoria have gone down the path of educating their residents in different recycling or composting options. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my sponsor, the William Buckland Foundation, as well as Nuffield Australia, for giving me this incredible opportunity. I'm especially fortunate to have been a 2019 scholar given the pandemic. I would also like to thank my husband, Wayne. He encouraged me to apply for the Nuffield Scholarship even though it's something that he said he always wanted to do. Wayne supported me fully and he also looked after our four children, two farms across Victoria and New South Wales, as well as running the business. Our extended family also assisted with meals and taking their kids off his hands at times so that he could focus on work. And our staff were also very understanding and stepped up in my absence. So I'm eternally grateful for that. I was also very fortunate to be part of the 2019 Japan GFP group. They were a fantastic group of scholars representing six countries in our group of 10. I travelled with them for six weeks and could not ask for a better group to be placed with. Their friendship and support throughout the GFP and beyond has helped in my personal development and I just can't wait till we can meet and catch up again. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Natasha. Um, Again, another terrific presentation that certainly makes you think about the whole value chain and how our produce meets, meets its, makes its way to the market. And the other thing that I'd just love to say is what, what an interesting year you've had racing home uh, from COVID and then uh, managing farms across the New South Wales, Victorian border. I can imagine you've had a considerable year in, uh, that you've put behind you. So well done for a terrific presentation and uh, look forward to some questions. Our last uh, presenter tonight is Tamara Ubigang. Tamara is from Miles, if my memory serves me rightly, as I pull up the Tamara's from Miles in Queensland and is a cotton uh, wheat chickpea grower. Um, Tamara, Tamara, like many scholars, um, 
applied for an Uffield scholarship and thinking this was the research area she went down and she, she changed her position as she went along and came with a terrific topping, which is farming fashions, connecting cotton fields to the catwalk. So Tamara, far away. I think that's me sharing my screen. Thanks, Rob. This evening, I'm wearing clothes and uh, even though you're in the comfort of your own home, I hope you are too, because that's what I'll be talking about. I'll be sharing the journey of how our clothes have come from farm to fibre to fashion, what's driven this and what might disrupt this. My name is Tamara Yubergang. I'm a food and fibre producer with my family near Miles on Queensland's Western Darling Downs. Home is a beautiful pocket called Berwindale, where in winter we grow wheat and chickpeas, in summer, sorghum, mung beans and cotton. As farmers, sustainable is something of a baseline. It's not a premium, not a luxury, and certainly not a passing fad. And it's here in this fundamental mentality that the chasm between crop and catwalk begins. Business of Fashion and McKinsey and Co have identified sustainability as one of the top five current trends. And I hope this is the beginning of a desperately needed and enduring reform. During the Global Focus Program, I was challenged to connect to the consumer. Until now, I had considered myself a bulk commodity producer, quite happy to wave our products off at the farm gate selling lint to a merchant and letting industry bodies do the heavy lifting of market access. Aside from appreciating a new outfit as much as the next person, I never imagined that I was connected to the fashion industry, let alone at the very beginning of the global juggernaut that is textile production. So from Brisbane to Brazil, Japan, England, America, New Zealand and Europe, I've met with fashion designers, lecturers, sustainability consultants, cotton merchants, fashion influencers, textile engineers, brand owners, and tech startups. I've observed that fashion is taking a good hard look at itself and not a moment too soon. They are the fourth largest contributor to global greenhouse gases and have a shocking rap sheet of human rights abuse. I'd never really heard of fast fashion and for those unaware, it's the practice of buying a $3 t-shirt in three different colours because it's trendy, cheap and disposable. It's the ultimate in consumerism and a symptom of a throwaway culture. This has been driving textile demand, but also generating waste to the tune of 23 kilos per person per year. This is three full suitcases if you're flying on Jetstar and to rub salt into the wound Two of those discarded suitcases contain garments that have never even been worn. So the elephant in the room is overconsumption. Margins in the rag trade are so thin they rely on volume to turn over, volume and turnover to satisfy this hungry beast. And as global trade has opened up, industry has chased the needle, looking for the lowest cost of production, raw materials and human resource. Now we obviously can't shut this down overnight and nor should we condemn it as wholly evil. There are certainly positives to, co to clothing being accessible as a means of self-expression and shelter. Industry minus exploitation is also a wonderful mechanism to lift countries out of poverty and into prosperity. So both of our industries are at a precipice. Fashion and agriculture are similarly under scrutiny. We're being called to reduce and recycle, to account for our carbon footprint, to be transparent and traceable, and to be here for more than just profit. Happily, Australian cotton is well placed to deliver on all of these criteria, especially as we already have a world-class best management program and several quite impressive stats regarding water and pesticides. Carbon neutrality, indeed positivity, is highly possible in the Australian farming context. As a custodian and a business person, 
one of my primary goals is to increase our soil carbon levels. There are already several remuneration schemes and accounting methodologies in use. However, the challenge here is consistency and tangibly connecting this with a final customer. Measuring and minimising our carbon footprint is still very much the privilege of the wealthy. Regardless, agriculture should be ready to step up as a solution to climate change, or at the very least, participate in the market surrounding this. The circular economy is a society in which there is no such thing as waste, and it's on the horizon. Being a renewable compostable product, cotton fits into this new era easily. Cotton has so many recycling options and boasts excellent end of life properties. Unlike our major competitor, it will literally return to the soil that, it produ that produced it. In Australia, we're, we have sophisticated technology and infrastructure. As well as this, we have an engaged and educated set of farmers. The only thing standing between us and full traceability through blockchain is cost. Finally, modern slavery is a hot button issue in fashion. From the plight of garment workers to prison camps in China or children exploited in India, the consumer really does care about this issue. And this is one matter where we can confidently but humbly invite scrutiny. So as we have a product that aligns with consumers and their values, how do we get there? Enter an extremely disjointed and convoluted supply chain. We have no onshore processing, so nearly all of the Australian crop finds its way to spinning mills in China or Southeast Asia. Spinning is often referred to as the black box of the supply chain. It's at this point that man-made fibres, cotton of all specific of all of varying specifics and origins some potentially dubious ones, are blended to make a yarn. There is now pressure from both ends of the supply chain to shed light in this space. We're at a stage where brands and retailers are wading back through their murky supply chains and closely examining all of their providers, sometimes right to the farm. Some brands have been publicly shamed and called to task so they are taking steps to scandal proof their business, while others are taking their fibre procurement very seriously and marketing it as a point of difference in their product. So this renewed interest in provenance has created an information vacuum, which has been filled by NGOs and certifying bodies, some driven by their own agenda, some obviously anti-cotton, but all are very vulnerable to greenwash. Several of these accreditation programs are making a difference in making sustainable, inexpensive and achievable. More education is required. But one such example of a successful scheme is the Better Cotton Initiative. Its logo can be seen on swing tags from low cost retailers through to high end brands and is certainly having, its, having an impact on volume. The system certainly has uh, foibles and detractors. I have heard it referred to as merely better than bad and also unacceptable to brands who were equating green credentials as a luxury. However, at a time when cotton is far more expensive than man-made fibre, it's worth reminding ourselves who our real competitor is. It's not Brazilian cotton, certified organic, Chinese cotton, American Supima, but synthetics. I'd wager we spend more time in active wear than jeans, but I wonder how many people know about microplastics. Each time a garment is washed, a synthetic garment is washed, fragments of plastic invisible to the naked eye are washed into the oceans. These are so tiny they've crossed into the food chain. Now this is a genuinely wicked problem. I believe heightened, heightened awareness regarding microplastics could have a significant global impact in fighting back cotton's market share. I'd have to ask if we can ban single use plastic bags, should we be looking at single use plastic clothes? Hypothetically, 
If our cotton was spun into a single origin yarn and could capture added value through a provenance and sustainability proposition, what technology is there available to prove it? There are dozens of blockchain platforms established and emerging, and I'll share these two specifically. Oratane is a DNA map of the area of origin that can then be matched with the final product, whether that be a garment in Country Road or a bottle of wine. Um, this technology is in use um, in Country Road to verify Australian cotton. Fibre trace is a rare earth mineral applied to the lint at ginning. It's presently being applied to a carbon positive cotton and used in the well-known brand Nobody Denim. Farmers often ask, rightly so, who is going to pay? And in my opinion, it's the growers who will pay if we do not keep up with consumer demands and expectations. So some recommendations. As consumers, we need to be discerning. Choose natural fibres. BCI is certifying cotton at breakneck speed, and presently only 20% of Australian bales are approved. I believe 100% of the Australian cotton of the Australian crop should be recognised as better. So thank you very much for journeying down this sustainable fashion rabbit hole with me. I must also thank Nuffield Australia, my sponsor, the Vertel Foundation, and my ever faithful friends and family. Safe to say that Nuffield really did stand between uh, dad and semi-retirement. To the wider community and my travel companions, I've been so humbled by those who've hosted me, explained their businesses, shared their learnings and engaged in interesting discussions. This has been a truly wonderful experience. So some final impacts is to know the supply chain, know where your product, where your garments have come from and keep buying clothes, but invest in pieces that you love, wear them as long as possible, then use them as rags before returning them to the earth. Thanks Tamara, fantastic presentation and, and something that really makes us think in terms of how, uh, how we consume and the role that agriculture plays in the whole supply chain. So, so thank you and uh, well done. Thank um, you. Look, where, where we'd like to go to now is, um, we've been sort of scrolling through quite a number of questions. Um, how the session will work is that we'll, we'll keep going with questions as, as long as we can. We, we've pulled a few of these up a little bit earlier in the past, but we'll just keep going until some of the questions extinguish. Some of, some questions have come up on Q&A and the scholars have answered them. Some of them are still there. So what I'll do is I'll just start asking some of those questions and, um, and we'll, we'll bring them through from there. Um, in no particular order, just the way they're coming up in front of me. Jake, I think one of the interesting questions, in, as much as it's related to your scholarship, but is also in terms of how the, the fruit and vegetable industries reacted to COVID. Um, what, what, Issues have there been in terms of transport and container and supply and other logistics getting your product out of Australia uh, and like all other commodities, has the market been impacted into China with the breakdown in the country relationships? Yeah, well, oh, is my microphone on? Yep, you're good, Jake. Uh, I can only really speak from our own point of view at this point and it was difficult getting fruit out of the country. Um, it was definitely much more difficult this year. It was uh, about twice as expensive as well. Uh, this probably would be, it would have been worse if some of the producers of stone fruit on the mainland had been able to pick all their fruit, but because they were dealing with a lack of labour, that lack of fruit also, yeah, made the competition for airspace slightly better. But um, in terms of marketing with China, yeah, we, we diversified quite a lot this year. We, we sent far more fruit to Vietnam than we have before, a little bit more to Singapore. The demand was still there from China, but there's just too much out of our control. Some custom worker could easily leave some fruit of ours out on a wharf somewhere and we have no recourse. So very difficult, very difficult, difficult year, basically. Thanks, Jake. Um, Anthony, I've got a couple of questions here for you. One, I'll start with a really easy one. Does virtual fencing require every animal to wear a collar? Um, and if you can then follow behind that with 
Um, what of your learnings have you implemented uh, at Currawira Flock and how do you propose to influence the industry with those changes? Yeah, uh, so for the virtual fencing, they, they did a bit of uh, research on that where they tried to just get um, some lead animals there. So you do the top 20% of the, the sheep flock, but um, yeah, after a while, they just re-rank in their terms of um, in who dominates the flock. So they might be able to hold them for a certain amount of time, say a couple of days, but then they they um, naturally just wander off and um, break from the mob a little bit. Uh, and especially one of the big benefits from virtual fencing is being able to you know graze quite heavily um, and rotate rotationally graze. Um, and there's yeah, there's no leader sheep out there that will um, stop hungry ones. So um, yeah, they they tend to wander off when they get hungry. Um, and in terms of uh, implementing back into the Karawira flock, um, you know, we've been profit driven from before uh, I did enough field. So um, we put half of our use to a, to a terminal flock. So we, we're very much, um, we're profit driven and we don't care which side of the, of the, um, the whether it comes from the wool or it comes from the sheep meat, we'll, we'll breed and uh, continue to run the most profitable sheep we can basically. Excellent, thank you. Um, Christina, um, from a question from Holly Bailey, who's uh, from Woolworths, one of our great sponsors. So thanks Holly for being online. Um, where do you think the organic R&D and &E should fit? Should it fit within uh, every other RDC or should it sit particularly within the organic industry? Uh, you yeah. I think that's a, a really great question. Um, I think just like any kind of R&D, if you uh, don't tailor your audience, then you're just creating content for anyone. So if you, if you have a really specific audience in mind, then you're actually able to uh, support that. Um, so if you wanna create uh, R&D specifically for organic farmers um, to, to help them to have higher yields, to help them to reduce inputs, um, then you need to put it under, an, uh, under the organic industry. If you're just looking into organic practices for farmers, then it can sit under any uh, body because organic, like we all started off as organic farmers. So technically the techniques for organic farmers are techniques for all farmers. Um, so yeah, I think it just depends on what the end goal is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Natasha, just a question uh, from one of our 2021 20, scholars. How do, you, how do you compete with fake international certified organic products? Is it something we can deal with with packaging or is it uh, something that, did you see anything in your travels that could come up to answer those problems? Um, good question there. Um, I haven't come across that so much in my travels. I do know that in Australia, we look for the trust mark. So whether it be the Bud Logo, um, NASA Certified Organic, or one of the other certifying bodies out there, um, I think it just pays for the consumer to you know, really do their research on the product that they're buying. Um, I haven't come across any product uh, in the fresh produce industry um, claiming to be certified organic from South America. I don't know if that answers your question or not, sorry. Yep. Okay. I'm just scrolling through some more questions here. Um, let's go back to the open questions. Um, uh, Tamara, do you see the local, I'm just reading as I read, do you see the local textile spinning, weaving and manufacturing investment being a key area in driving sustainable local food fibres that aren't impacted by international marketplaces and providing local employment opportunities? Oh, absolutely, Rob. I um, I think we know how vulnerable how vulnerable we are when we have one major trading partner. Um, luckily, Cotton Australia has done a lot of uh, you know good work in maintaining other markets, but um, certainly local manufacturing to um, to create a yarn that then could be a truly single origin yarn is a big opportunity. Um, 
Historically, I think it's been constrained by a high cost of labour and high cost of electricity. But I believe as we um, you know, move towards robotic futures with um, renewable energy, we should keep examining this regularly. Thanks, Tamara. Um, a question from Wade Mann, um, who's, uh, I can't remember how long ago, Wayne did his scholarship. Uh, he says, I concur with your comments about the course of the pandemic and the majority of consumers turn to packaged products to eliminate cross-contamination. Did you encounter any resistance to biogradable and recyclable packaging from the core supermarkets due to potential compromises in shelf life retention? That's a question to Natasha, of course. A uh, good question. Thank you, Wade. Um, I haven't come across too much um, uh, rejection from the supermarket on that particular topic. The, the line that the supermarkets are going with for us tends to be um, the fact that there's very little compostable facilities in Australia at the moment for commercial and, like I said in my presentation, the, um, the supermarkets are wanting to go either less packaging or recyclable packaging because we have recycle stations um, in Victoria, I'm thinking around most of the country. They do have um, the big wheelie bins in the supermarkets where people can dispose of their soft plastics, uh, which will then go onto a recycling facility. The issue with compostable packaging within the supermarkets is that, um, like I said, the consumer education, whether it be by the retailer, by local government, or even by um, you know state and national governments in the country here, um, if there's not that education there, and somebody puts a compostable, um, you know plastic looking bag from their lettuce into their recycling, it, it does mess up the recycling um, uh, process in the recycling stations. So I think that's the main hesitation at the moment from the supermarkets based on that. Thanks, Natasha. Um, Jake, another question for you. Have other growers in your area now invested in cooling technologies? Um, like yours, and I'm keen to understand the business barriers to making this sort of investment is a lack of knowledge or, in fi or financial only. Uh, just might start again there, Jake. We've just got to get you unmuted. Yep. Yep, I'm unmuted. Um, lack of knowledge, I would say. And I'm not sure. To answer the second part of your question there, that if I hadn't done Nuffield, was, were we already considering this technology? Yes and no. It was only seeing a conference on this technology that made me apply for Nuffield in the first place because I was so interested in it. Other growers are heading more down uh, inline hydrocooling sort of path that I, I mentioned within my presentation. It's not quite the same. It is, I guess, the same end result, the same end goal is consistent across the industry. Is anybody else in our industry going to continue with forced air cooling like we are? Hard to say. I've presented it. There's some interest. Uh, the biggest barrier is the current design of our box and the biosecurity issues that we have with that. We've jumped over some hurdles to get through and, and use these vented boxes as we have. Uh, no one else has attempted those hurdles yet. Um. Thanks, Jake. Um, there's a question here for all scholars. Um, given, given most of the presentations and have been involved about the connection with our produce and the consumer, should Australian growers be quality assured under leading international run integrity schemes, or is it advantageous to be certified under Australian owned schemes meeting domestic standards? So anyone can take that one up. Oh, well, uh, I'll give it a crack, Rob. Um, I mean, w generally speaking, we're an export nation. We're similar to New Zealand where we ex export 80 plus percent of our, um, our produce. I mean, there's probably some people, um, areas like the organics and that where it's probably a little bit more, even that's quite an export um, driven industry. So I think we've got to meet the demands of where our, of, uh, our, our domestic people first. So we've got the license to do what we do here. Um, but then basically we need to, meet the demands of our uh, international markets or the end consumers wherever they are across the world. Agreed. 
No, I don't. Thanks, thanks, Anthony. I'll just have a look to see whether we've got any more. Um, uh, Jake, another one for you. Uh, J Wade tells me he's a 2015 scholar. Jake, any progress on controlled atmosphere storage during transport for export cherries, as it's a pretty hot topic in the berry sector? Any progress on controlled atmosphere? Yeah. It's not really a thing in cherries. Uh, we pack into um, modified atmosphere packaging. All, all fruit is essentially shipped in just refrigerated transport. So we're more uh, focused on our own packaging to control the atmosphere of our fruit rather than the, uh, the shipping atmosphere, unfortunately. All right. Thanks then, Jake. Look, uh, like with most things, Zoom, we've, we've been going now for an hour, nearly an hour and a half. So um, unless anyone's got a desperate question they'd like to add, they want to be fast and get it in. Um, so no, I haven't seen any more come up. So look, I'd firstly like to say thanks very much to, to our present pre presenters tonight. A fantastic effort. Um, it's a culmination of a, of a pretty long journey. It, it, your nuffield journey does start to feel like it's a long period of time from application all the way through to, to presenting. Um, of course, these presentations would have been nice to do at a conference, which we hope that you'll still have an opportunity to do um, in the near future. Um, I'd like to thank our attendees. Um, we've had a good number of attendees tonight who have, who have hung in there and listened um, for, for a long period of time. Um, so, so thank you. I think uh, Jody's just texted me there saying we've had 160 in total listen, listen to our presentation. So that's been a, been a great outcome. Um, and I think the other thing that we can learn from, from tonight is that, that Nuffield's a, a journey about learning about lots of different things. It's technological, it's, um, it's personal. There's lots of personal learnings that go on. Um, it's, it's learning about yourself, it's skill development and all those things that occur through a Nuffield scholarship. So and I'm sure I'm sure the presenters tonight have, have all gone through that experience and, and gained a lot from it. So um, I finally like to sort of thank again our, our sponsors and those that, that make it really viable and, and effective that we can run these scholarships. Um, and also thank the scholars for these presentations and the ability to, for us to allow them that uh, uh, YouTube technology to be allowed to provide content to our, our sponsors and supporters who have been desperate for content through the COVID period. So much appreciated for that. Um, so normally at this time, we'd ask for a round of applause, but it's the time of night where most people have probably got a glass in their hand. So we'll all raise a glass to you and say thank you very much and congratulations uh, on your scholarship and your presentations tonight. So thank you. And um, could Jody also just put up, could we also remember to do our feedback form? So that would be terrific as well. So thanks very much. Good night and uh, good luck with your future endeavours to the presenters. Thank you, everyone.